Okay, everybody, this is chapter one in our... Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. This is chapter one in our uh, microbiology textbook where we're going to take a look at uh, the impact of microbiology on our history, on human history. Um, one of the things that we have to appreciate about microbiology is that uh, it's, a, it's an entire subdiscipline of biology that didn't really exist until uh, the invention of the microscope by a gentleman named Leeuwenhoek because we were only able to see to the limit of human vision. And so this opened up a whole new universe that basically changed the way that we perceive the world around us. What we're going to do in this chapter is talk about the discovery of microbes and their relationship to human health, uh, including the tools of microscopy and medical statistics. We'll talk about Koch's postulates, and we'll talk about how environmental microbes are critical for life on the planet. Within this section, we're going to define what a microbe is, talk about why the definition can be somewhat challenges, challenging. We'll talk about the three major domains of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, and we'll explain what they have in common and what makes them different, and then we'll talk about viruses versus living cells. So, we have to go way, way back in our planet's history to talk about the origin of life, right? Um, the Earth is, is millions and millions of years old, and for the longest part of its history, there was no life on the planet. But somehow, all right, life appeared. Okay, and we don't know exactly what the process of that was. All right, um, it may have drifted to Earth from another location. It may have originated from non-living material. We really don't know. But we do know that at some point, the first living cell appeared on planet Earth, okay? Um, these were microscopic cells and they were very similar to um, what we call today um, bacteria, all right? Um, they had a, uh, an undefined nucleus, they had genetic material, DNA, okay? Um, they had a cytoplasm, a cell membrane, a cell wall, all right? and they were able to perform all the things that we associate with life. They were able to respond to their environment, make waste, grow, move, um, metabolize. Um, they were able to uh, change over time, all right? And um, they were able to reproduce, okay? Those are things that we associate with a living organism. So we say that the cell is the small, use, smallest unit of living, li living matter and the bacterial cell would be the first or one of the earliest living building blocks. <coughs> Over time what happened was that these cells began to associate with each other because um, the environment began to change. A uniform environment on planet Earth began to become more variable, right? Parts got dry, parts got wet, parts got salty, parts got less salty, um, parts got warm, parts got cold, okay? Um, and with the changing environment, we had to come up with a more complex body plan in order to adapt to life on a changing planet. And the biofilm was the first attempt at this, right? These were associations of single cells that um, had sort of division of labor, right? Some groups of cells could um, find and build a home. Um, usually this was a, in, in, in a biofilm, a sort of a matrix or a secretion from the cells. Some of the cells were good at procuring nutrients and providing um, building blocks and energy for the rest of the community, and then some of the cells were very good at defending against um, attack, okay? Just a few of the things that an organism needs to do in order to live, right? And so what happened over time was that these communities of cells became so dependent on each other that they formed the first tissues. The tissue is just a group of cells that does something as a gang that a 
a single cell cannot, okay? And that eventually became um, the first multicellular organism with organs, organ systems, and um, the ability to adapt more effectively to changing conditions, okay? Um, this took millions of years, all right? But the process that brought this about is something called evolution and natural selection, which you learned about in general bio. And basically, it simply says that in, in any population of organisms, you're going to have tiny changes, differences, between those organisms because of differences in their genetic material, which gives them different characteristics. And then that population in that particular environment is going to have some individuals that will live long enough to breed and pass those traits on to their offspring and some individuals that won't. And the result of that will be that those genetic characteristics that provide a, a breeding advantage are the ones that are going to be selected for in that environment. And over time, all of those collected changes will result in a new species. Okay? And so that is the theory behind all the variety of life that you see on the planet today. Okay? Evolution and natural selection. We can see natural selection in real time. In fact, in some of our simulated labs, we will see natural selection. Um, but um, evolution is something that takes many, many generations, and so isn't directly observable in real time. But we do have evidence of it in the fossil record. Modern-day microorganisms are called microbes, and they include bacteria and yeasts, which are single-celled eukaryotes, and protists which are also eukaryotic, okay? Some microbes aren't microscopic, and some microscopic animals aren't microbes, right? And again, this was an entire world that we were unaware of until the arrival of the microscope, okay? Most of the microbes that we interact with are beneficial or they don't cause any harm. Um, in, in case you're unaware, the environment in which you live is not sterile. Okay, it is filled with with microbes um, that are on you, in you, and around you all the time. But the the large majority of them are not going to hurt you, and in fact, they crowd out space and and resources that that bad microbes called pathogens would use to cause disease in the body. Okay, humans are inhabited by ten times as many bacterial as they have human cells, so we are like a hotel, right? We have many guests. Less than one percent of known bacterial species are pathogenic, meaning cause disease, right? Some of these illnesses caused by bacteria can be life-threatening, and history has focused on that small subset because of the tremendous impact on human life on the planet, not to mention the lives of other organisms, such as crops or um, uh, fisheries or um, other species that end up suffering from diseases brought about by microbes, right? Humans aren't the only ones that can fall victim to these, these entities that are too small to see with the naked eye, right? The two basic types of cellular architecture are prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic, the word means not a true nucleus, right? Karyo means nucleus, okay? And prokaryotic means really a primitive or a precursor to a nucleus, right? They have, a, they have an area where genetic material is located, but it's not surrounded by a nuclear membrane, so it's not considered to be a true nucleus and it's simply suspended in cytoplasm, right? Prokaryotes include the bacteria and the archaea, okay? Archaea means ancient ones, all right? Well, eukaryotic cells are generally larger, okay? And they have membrane-bound and non-membrane-bound organelles. It's a more complex architecture. Um, and as a result, a bit more adaptable, okay? Eukaryotic microbes include everything except the bacteria and the archaea, right? Fungi, protozoa, algae, okay? Um, plants, animals, right? All eukaryotic, 
okay? For microbial eukaryotes, we're talking fungi, protozoa, and unicellular algae, okay? A virus is an unusual actor, okay? Uh, a virus is basically a, a, a delivery vehicle for genetic material, okay? It consists of a protein coat, sometimes uh, a membrane envelope, and then genetic material of some kind. It can either be D single or double-stranded DNA or single or double-stranded RNA. And then there might be, in some viruses, an enzyme or two, which is a protein that carries out a chemical reaction, that we don't have in our own cells and tissues. Okay? Are they alive? Um, the, the, the general feeling is, no, they're not alive because they, they lack the ability to reproduce independently. They have to reproduce inside a host in order to make more copies of themselves. Okay? They use the host machinery as the mechanism to generate more virus particles. Okay? Um, and like I said, the, the debate over whether they're alive, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing debate, but the current feeling is that um, they're not because they don't reproduce independently of a host. Okay. Um, they're not cellular in their architecture, right? They're just protein, maybe some membrane, and genetic material. Okay. Next section, we'll talk about how microbial diseases have changed human history and how microbes participate in cultural practices. Okay. Examples, right? Throughout history, more soldiers have died from microbial infection than from battle, right? This is this was one of the major uh, stumbling blocks that um, we didn't overcome really until the invention of the microscope and, and the formulation of the germ theory of disease, right? There was a time, for instance, when we used to do surgery without washing our hands or cleaning our instruments, okay? And I know that that sounds um, incomprehensible today, but um, the result of most of those surgical procedures was death from massive infection, right? Which, it doesn't surprise us, but back then, um, before the advent of the discovery of, of microbes, right, we didn't really understand why some people recovered and some people didn't, because humans tend to only believe what they can see, right? Another example, right, smallpox that came um, to America from Europe exterminated a lot of the native population of North America because they lacked resistance to it, right? Bubonic plague wiped out a third of Europe's population in the 14th century, um, and it was caused by a bacterium known as Yersinia pestis. The plague-induced population decline enabled social transformation in the Renaissance, and another interesting result of the bubonic plague is that it selected for individuals who, um, whose descendants are resistant to the AIDS virus, okay? Um, an interesting story there, right? Mycobacterium tuberculosis was prevalent in overcrowded cities and became a symbol of the tragic youth in European literature in the 19th century. Um, tuberculosis caused by the tubercle bacillus uh, the disease tuberculosis used to be called consumption, right? And one of the principal symptoms was coughing up blood and then eventually just wasting away, okay? And again, we didn't have, at that time, antibiotics, and we didn't even know what uh, pathogenic bacteria were, right? Microscopes revealed the microbial world, right? Robert Hooke built the first compound microscope, okay? He observed mites and nematodes and published in the 1600s his first illustration of microscopic objects. He called the distinct units of living material cells, okay, following up on work that was done by Leeuwenhoek before him. Okay, he was a lens grinder and invented one of the first primitive microscopes. Leeuwenhoek developed ground lenses stronger than hooks and was the first to observe bacterial cells but we still didn't connect microbes with human disease, right? 
So it took nearly 200 years before the connection was made between a microbe and a disease process, right? And again, uh, this was back in, in the 16, 17, 16 and 1700s that he did his work, okay? Before 1850, theories on the cause of disease affecting humans didn't include microbes, right? Um, what were some of these theories? Well, they were, throughout human history, theories of disease have been interesting to say the least. Um, if we go to the, uh, the ancient Mayans, right, who lived in uh, Central America, right, Yucatan Peninsula, um, there's evidence from some of the, uh, the ancient ruins that uh, they believed that the, the way to fix certain human diseases um, was basically to uh, carve a hole in your head to let the demons out, right? And they know this because they found mass graves full of skulls with holes in them, okay? Um, and you would think that probably every person that had that procedure done to them uh, died, but it turns out that's not the case because in a lot of cases the skulls actually had the wounds that they healed over, right? So it's amazing that those people survived. Um, in the Middle Ages, it was believed that um, your health was determined by the balance of the humors in your body, right? Fluids, including phlegm and bile and blood um, and, and sweat, okay, I had to be properly balanced in order for you to be well. So back then, the, uh, the job of barber, doctor, and surgeon was held by one man, right? So if you felt ill, you would go to the barber, who's also the doctor, and he would do bloodletting, right? So he would cut you and, or apply leeches, and he would remove a certain amount of blood. And then when he was uh, satisfied that enough blood had been taken out, he would pronounce you cured, and he would send you on your way, right? And he used to dry his bloody rags on a white pole outside his door, and believe it or not, that is the origin of the barbershop pole. Kind of interesting. Um, other... Um, beliefs in disease, uh, possession, right, possession by demons, or curses, okay, um, offending the gods, right, it wasn't until the connection was made between microbes and disease that we were able now to, um, for the first time, uh, understand a little bit more about what makes us sick, right, Louis Pasteur proved that bacteria were living things incapable of reproducing and potentially acting as agents of disease. And he did that with, um, with broth, rich nutrient medium, which he sterilized and then placed in special flasks that had um, a neck that had an S-curve in it that um, um, would cause the media to remain sterile as long as uh, the neck wasn't broken, but if he broke off the neck of the flask, what happened was that the media became flocculent, it, it, it became turbid, it got growth in it, um, and that was his proof that there was something in the air that was alive that could grow in the media, okay? Um, Spallanzani was also the first to observe a bacterial cell dividing process known as binary fission. Okay, so these were these were slow progressions of learning about what a microbe was all about. Right. Next topic will be uh, the germ theory of disease, and we'll talk about Florence Nightingale. Okay, and then we'll talk about Koch's postulates. Very important, right? Um. One of the things that we have to appreciate, again, about um, human disease is that um, it, it, it takes careful experimentation in order to establish um, with, with a fair degree of certainty um, what the cause of a particular disease is, okay? Um, if we look at the idea of the germ theory of disease, right, um, specific diseases 
are caused by microscopic germs in this theory. Um, it was observed that disease was common in overcrowded areas like cities and also when people are packed in very tightly, such as during warfare, during an attack. It was Florence Nightingale that demonstrated the significance of mortality due to disease. And what she did was um, she was able to, um, using um, a technique where she uh, generated a rendering here showing uh, the months of the year and then a pie chart with with these wedges drawn in here um, she noticed that the area of each wedge measured from the center represents the proportion of deaths due to one cause right the blue wedges represent deaths due to infectious diseases such as typhus and cholera the red represent deaths due to wounds, and the black wedges represent all other causes of death. And she concluded that death due to infectious disease accounted for half of all mortality rather than poor nutrition. So diseases were ended up being highest in the summer months when the pathogens would multiply most rapidly. Right? Nightingale published the first nursing textbook and founded a nursing school. Medical statistics is a discipline used to calculate the proportions of populations succumbing to infectious disease and um, this polar area chart uh, which represents the deaths of soldiers due to various causes was um, basically part of the genesis of this particular discipline right so you can see here so many dying from infectious disease right but notice when it was cold out not so much right Epidemiology is the scientific study of epidemics of diseases such as cholera and typhoid and evolved to include protecting public health through disease prevention and control. Today, um, the major agencies involved in um, the practice of epidemiology are the CDC and the WHO. Okay? Um, as an example, right, the CDC tracks seasonal flu and tries to predict which strains will require vaccination in a given year and that also determines what's going to go in the vaccine in order to be effective right and of course nobody guesses perfectly that's why some people will have a flu shot and still come down with the flu okay um, in addition to the fact that in any population um, an injection of anything from a from a vaccine to a, a, a life-saving drug has the potential to cause what's known as an adverse event, okay? And those generally are allergic reactions to some component in the injection, okay? So when people complain that they got a flu shot and then they got the flu, what more likely happened was that they had an allergic reaction to what was in the vaccine, okay? And the reason for that, as we'll get into when we talk about immunity, is that while everybody's immune system it works the same way, has the same function, right? The pieces that make it work that way are different from individual to individual, okay? Koch was the first to establish that anthrax was caused by a microbial infection, and he developed a pure culture technique and Koch's postulates to identify the causative agent of a disease. Examples include anthrax, TB, malaria, bubonic plague, okay? So let's take a look at Koch's postulates. At the end of the 19th century, Robert Koch defined how we would recognize if a disease was infectious or not, whether it was a communicable disease or not. So obviously people get sick. The thing to know is is this sickness caused by an infectious microorganism or is it caused by something else? And Robert Koch brilliantly generated what he called, what are now called Koch's postulates, Robert Koch's postulates. So how do we define if a disease is infectious? Well, first of all, the causative agent must be found in every lesion of the case. So if someone's sick, you should be able to detect that somewhere in their body. 
And this is why we do culture and sensitivity tests. So if someone has a wound infection, we'll take a swab of the wound edgy date, send that to the microbiologists, they'll culture it up and tell us what antibiotics it's sensitive to. Or if someone has a chest infection and they're coughing up infected sputum, again, we can take a sample of that sputum, send it for culture and sensitivity, and if there's an etiological pathogenic microorganism in there, that will be detectable. Because Cox postulates say that the specific causative agent must be found in every case of the disease. Now, you might not find it straight away, but it will be there somewhere. Or well, the other one we do in hospital if someone is developing severe sepsis is we'll do blood cultures. So we'll take the blood and see if there's bacteria growing in the blood. And these days we can also do the same with viruses. It's harder with viruses to culture viruses, but we can. So the first postulate is if this disease is genuinely caused by this infectious organism, if it is actually an infectious communicable disease, then first of all, we should be able to identify the bacteria in lesions of the case. The next thing is, having got this bacteria, it should be possible to grow it up in a culture. And microbiologists do this. They put the bacteria on agar plates and they'll then grow them up. They'll grow many millions or billions of the bacteria so it becomes very easy to identify it. And then, if you take a healthy subject and give them the bacteria, or give them the virus, that healthy subject should then develop the disease. Now, thankfully, we don't do this every time in clinical practice, but this is, this is the science behind it. So you grow up the bacteria, you give the bacteria to a healthy subject, and that healthy subject will get the same disease as the first patient had, because it's communicable, it shows that. And then if you want to be pedantic, the fourth criteria is, is again that you should be able to recover the organism from the person that you've deliberately infected. So let's take an example. In the 1990s, a young Australian doctor called Barry Marshall said that stomach ulcers, duodenal ulcers, peptic ulcers anyway, said peptic ulcers were caused by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. And at the time, this seemed to be a ludicrous idea, the idea that peptic ulcers was caused by and in fact a bacteria. So what Barry Marshall did was he got some helicobacter, he cultured them, he got a nice big vial of these helicobacter pylori and then he took a healthy subject, he took himself and he drank a heavy draught of the helicobacter pylori and as a result of getting that he got severe gastric inflammation and ulceration demonstrating that it was the helicobacter that caused the uh, gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers and gastritis in his case. Then fortunately he was able to treat himself by eradicating the helicobacter. That's why now if someone's complaining of peptic ulcers we give them hel helicobacter pylori eradication therapy to get rid of the bacteria and that cures the vast majority of patients. So really what Barry Marshall did was use Cox postulates to prove that it was actually an infectious condition. So remember, you must be able to identify the bacteria and lesions of the case, grow the bacteria up, cause the disease in a new subject if you inject that back or give that, inoculate with that bacteria, and then from the new subject you should be able to culture uh, the organism once again. Robert Cox postulates to demonstrate that a disease is infectious and transmissible in nature. Cox postulates can't always be applied to ID the cause of every disease. An example is mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes symptoms in only 10% of the people that are infected. Okay, so they're called um, asymptomatic carriers, all right? and they can spread the disease but not have any outward symptoms of it. 
HIV is difficult to detect in its early stages and is an exclusively human pathogen. As a result, following the postulates which involve affecting human subjects with HIV would be unethical, right? Because outside of tissue culture, there really isn't an effective way to do that, okay? Um, in rare instances, researchers have voluntarily exposed themselves to a proposed pathogen. An example is Barry Marshall infecting himself with Helicobacter pylori to show that it could colonize the stomach and cause something known as a gastric ulcer. Okay, But that's not something that's commonly done. By 1000 BCE in Indian China, Exposing a person to fluids from a pox pustule was being used to prevent deaths from smallpox. In the 18th century, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who was a pox survivor and the wife of the British ambassador, brought the practice over to England. A similar practice of smallpox inoculation was introduced to American colonies by a slave, Onimisius, from the Coral Manatee people of Africa, he persuaded his master, Reverend Dr. Cotton Mather, to promote smallpox inoculation while an epidemic was devastating Boston. Okay, Now, again, this is an example of applied medicine, right? This is something that, that had been demonstrated to work, but the people that did it didn't really understand why it worked. Okay? They just did it and they knew that it was effective. The reason that this works as we'll find out when we talk about immunology, is that there are antigens, small molecules on the surface of these, um, of these, uh, these fluids, okay, which um, resemble the small molecules that are on the pathogens. And when you expose yourself to these antigens in these fluids, you develop an immune response to those antigens which provides cross immunity to the pathogen itself. Okay, and the agents that do that are called uh, lymphocytes. Okay, and we'll learn about those when we talk about immunity as well. To decrease the risk of serious disease that occurred with human smallpox, Edward Jenner used the fluid from cowpox instead of human smallpox. The cowpox inoculation was called a vaccination. Okay, and again, he didn't understand the mechanism. He just understood that it worked. Okay, he observed that it worked through experimentation. Okay, Louis Pasteur showed that exposure to attenuated strains of bacteria provided immunity to a disease without even causing the severe symptoms. Right, Pasteur was aware of vaccination, and in the spring of 1879, he was studying foul cholera, and had isolated the bacteria responsible but left his work for the summer for a long vacation. No refrigeration was able to preserve the cultures, and when he returned, the aged bacteria failed to cause the disease. He then obtained fresh bacteria as well as fresh chickens. His original chickens failed to contract the cholera with the fresh bacteria, but the new chickens did. The weakened state of the old bacteria didn't allow the chickens to contract the cholera from the fresh cultures, because the old cultures provided immunity to the virulent form. Okay? And the reason being they had antigens on their surface which could do the job. Right? Knowing that germs caused disease in humans led to a lot of breakthroughs in disease prevented. John Snow stopped an epidemic of cholera by IDing the source of a bacteria uh, which was a well in the community and disabling its access. Ignat Schlem Semmelweis suggested that hygienic practices among doctors could prevent, could protect patients and prevent disease. And Joseph Lister used chemical treatment of surgical instruments to prevent transmission of disease. And you might recognize a household product in most every bathroom in the country named after him, Listerine. Okay, and I know this all seems obvious to us, right? But back then. These were huge breakthroughs. Okay. Fleming noted a mold growing in one of his cultures killing bacteria 
growing around it, right, a cleared area, right? Turns out that this was the result, again, of, of poor lab practice, right? Fleming worked in a lab where the people in the lab left the window open and left their bacterial cultures in the sink and didn't clean up, and then the mold started growing on the bacterial lawns and created a zone of inhibition, as you can see here in the, the lower right, right? And he thought, well, what is it in the mold that's killing the bacteria? And he eventually was able to um, provide data that eventually led to the isolation of penicillin, right? Florian Chain purified the chemical that the mold made and treated patients who were dying of bacterial infection. And the mass production of penicillin is the birth of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and again, um, this wasn't unknown, okay? If, if you go to a book of home remedies, um, Foxfire was published um, back in the 70s as a collection of um, home remedies from areas like Appalachia. And one of the, one of the treatments for an infected cut was to rub moldy bread on it, okay? Well, they didn't understand why, but it turns out that the moldy bread was growing penicillium mold, and the penicillin in the penicillium mold was able to reduce the degree of infection, okay? Over-reliance on antibiotics as wonder drugs drove the rapid evolution of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Some infectious diseases are once again untreatable with antibiotics, um, including uh, tuberculosis and staph infections, right? Um, and gram-negative enterobacteria, as well as something you probably heard about, uh, which is a nosocomial infection known as MRSA, which stands for methicillin-resistant staph aureus, okay? That's the aureus that's here, right? Methicillin is just a, 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 a ramped-up version of penicillin. Right? Research to find new antibiotics was halted by pharmaceutical com companies right, in order to avoid um, this production of um, what they call superbugs. Now, why does this happen? Okay? The reason this happens is because bacteria have the ability to exchange genetic material between them. They can do something called conjugation, in which they're able to move genetic information from one bacterial cell to another and any drug resistance that's on that genetic material ends up being picked up by the recipient, right? And if enough donors end up providing genetic information to a recipient, they become multi-drug resistant and almost impossible to kill through the use of antibiotics, okay? We have, now have some strains of venereal disease that are resistant to up to 25 antibiotics. So if you get this, you have to rely on your immune system to take care of it as opposed to an antibiotic. Right? Viruses are, are a different entity. Right? Early germ hunters noted that some diseases were filterable and therefore could not be bacterial cells because they um, were able to pass through things like a porcelain filter and still cause disease. Infective particles causing disease in tobacco plants were crystallized by Stanley. Uh, an example is tobacco mosaic virus or TMV. They are non-cellular agents of disease. Okay? This is TMV here. It infects a lot of different kinds of plants. It's so infectious that plants can be infected by people smoking TMV contaminated cigarettes only takes a few virus particles to produce the disease. It's a helical tube of protein containing genetic material coiled inside it. The genetic material in this case is RNA. Toward the end of the 20th century, even smaller infected particles were discovered consisting of a molecule of RNA or of protein. Okay, RNA alone, uh, they call them viroids, and protein alone, they call them prions. Okay, so you can see here it's a, it's a very simple structure, right? Some protein, maybe some membrane, and then genetic material. It's just a, uh, a gene delivery system, basically. We'll talk about how microbes participate in ecosystems, and we'll talk about where mitochondria chloroplasts came from. Okay? 
Winogradsky was one of the first scientists to study microbes in their natural habitat. Marshes and wetlands support bacteria known as lithotropes, litho means stone or mineral, which feed on inorganic molecules. Okay. Winogradsky developed enrichment culture methods and selective growth to grow some bacteria and exclude others. Right? In order to, basically what he did was create an artificial microenvironment that only would support the growth of his target organism. Right? Lynn Margulis first proposed that the energy converting organelles of eukaryotes, mitochondria chloroplasts, evolved as a result of endosymbiosis. Okay? Um, basically the idea here is that the most primitive cells on the planet were here prior to the arrival of the eukaryotic cell and what happened early in evolution was that the eukaryotic cell and some primitive bacteria formed an association in which the bacteria would live inside the eukaryotic cell and provide all the energy it needed while the eukaryotic cell would provide shelter and nutrients. Over time these bacteria became so dependent on the host that they lost the ability to live independently of the host and so they became obligate endosymbionts and the evidence for this comes from the comparison of the genetic material in mitochondria to bacterial genetic material and the existence of bacterial ribosomes in mitochondria um, unlike the composition of the ribosomes in the eukaryote in the cytoplasm okay and apparently the same route happened with the evolution of the chloroplast. An, an early photosynthetic prokaryote was able to form an endosymbiotic relationship with one of the um, primitive plant cells, right? And the result was a photosynthetic um, eukaryotic organism, which eventually gave rise to uh, the photosynthetic algae and then eventually the vascular plants, okay? So the evidence for this, again, comes from the genetic material in the chloroplast and the ribosomes in the chloroplast, which are more like bacteria than they are eukaryotic. Okay. In 77, Woolsey proposed a new form of prokaryotic life called archaea that had characteristics distinct from bacteria and eukaryotes. Archaea are basically extremophiles, so they like to live in environments that don't support other types of life. Okay? Um, they produce sturdy enzymes that can be used for industrial processes and clinical identification procedures such as PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction, and is a chemical process in which trace amounts of DNA can be amplified using a thermostable DNA polymerase, an enzyme that makes DNA, in order to produce enough DNA to analyze, okay, for instance, at crime scenes. We'll talk about the structure of DNA, how it was discovered, and its impact and significance on life on the planet, and describe how the manipulation of DNA has transformed medicine, right? The discovery of the structure and the function of DNA in the 50s transformed medicine and biotechnology. Without her knowledge, Rosalind Franklin's X-ray structure of the DNA double helix was shared with Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick and Maurice Wilkins went on to win the 1962 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine um, by publishing a one-page paper in Nature elucidating the structure of DNA. Okay. Um, there were other pieces of data that contributed as well. Um, the base pairing of the bases in the double helix was the result of uh, the work of an organic chemist, um, the X-ray diffraction from Franklin, and then the brainstorming by Watson and Crick. Right? Watson and Crick didn't actually do any wet work on the DNA. They simply were able to put all the pieces together. Okay? DNA sequencing, which revealed the nucleotide sequences of a virus, was developed by Fred Sanger in 77. 
sequencing of the genome of a cellular organism, Haemophilus influenzae, was completed in 95, and sequencing of the human genome was completed in 03. DNA sequencing of the genomes of human bacterial symbionts in the Human Microbiome Project is currently ongoing. So what is this? This is basically a technique that allows us to determine the order in which the, the bases of the DNA double helix are attached to each other. And using this information, we are able to deduce the, um, the gene products, the proteins that are encoded by many of these stretches of DNA, and then connect functions to them. This is an ongoing effort, okay, and has resulted in gigantic databases um, where we're trying to essentially fill in the, the, the sequencing information with the functional information, which is something that's coming in all the time, okay? We've since learned that not all pieces of DNA are going to be used in transcription, and not all transcribed DNA is used to make protein, okay? But the basic flow of information, known as the central dogma, is from DNA to RNA to protein to trait. Okay? And we'll learn more about that in the upcoming chapters. Okay, uh, that brings us to the end, and I will join you in the next podcast.